My name is Pastor Nathan Deesom. I'm going to set a timer for myself just because I'm so excited to be back here with you guys. It's been a little bit of, it's been, been a little while. Um, here we go. Stop, watch, go. <laughs> this is the last sermon in our Go series, but if you've been enjoying it like I have, don't worry. It is also the theme of this entire year. It's, to, to be, if you're a first-time guest or a first several-time guest or if you've recently started coming to Sunrise, you picked a good time of year. January is always a terrific time of year to get introduced to Sunrise Church because we are starting something new, starting something fresh, starting something we will be studying for the entire year, and this has been a great one. Go! We get this concept, we get this theme from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. These are Jesus' last words in the Gospel of Matthew, some of his last words here on earth before he'll return again. And Matthew says, or Jesus says this in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And for the last two sermons, three weeks because of the snow delay, but for the last two sermons, Pastor Daryl has been unpacking this for us. In the first message of the Go series, Pastor Daryl unpacked that go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Pastor Daryl explained to us that disciples are different from believers. Not every believer is a disciple. Every disciple is a believer. You've got to be a believer in order to be a disciple. But there is an additional step. There's something else you have decided to do in order to become a disciple, and that is to obey. That is to, that is to follow. That is to go. And we are really going to be exploring that this entire year. I'm excited. I go to these meetings. I know the kind of things we're going to be talking about in the weeks to come. And it is really, really awesome. Discovering what it means to be a disciple, a doer, an obeyer, a goer. The week after that, Pastor Daryl unpacked what it means to be baptized. Baptism is the first, well, it doesn't have to be the first, but it is a natural, it is a very useful symbol to say, I am transitioning from a believer, which I already was. I'm not allowed to be baptized if I wasn't already a believer. From a believer to a disciple, and I want everyone to know about it, and I want everyone to see it. And in several weeks, many people are going to have the opportunity to do, to do just that which is extremely exciting. Today, I am going to be exploring verse 20, where Jesus says in Matthew 28, uh, verse 20, that part of going, part of being a disciple, is to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. All that I have commanded you. I went to Bible college and then seminary for, for many years, and I've learned something I want to share with you. All means all. Yeah. I spent a lot of money to learn that. <laughs> all means all. So today, this is going to be a 47-hour sermon teaching you all that Jesus has commanded you to know. We're going to unpack what that means, what it means to observe, to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. And I think a very useful passage to unpack that and to explore that is from the, the letter that Jesus' half-brother, I say half-brother because Jesus um, and James had the same mother, Mary, James' father was Joseph, Jesus' adopted father. Jesus' father is God the Father. Um, but James unpacks in a very useful way, makes it very easy for us to understand what it means to observe Jesus' commands in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. It's in your worship folders. Um, if you have a Bible here with you, it'd be, it'd be terrific to follow along there as well. And what we will discover today, I hope, is that James helps us understand what Jesus was saying when he says, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And it is this. Disciples don't just hear Jesus' commands. Disciples obey them. Disciples do them. Disciples follow them. Disciples go. Let's jump into it. James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This is an extremely useful passage in Scripture. It's also a very useful passage in James. It basically unpacks everything James wants to talk about. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And the thing that I think James is teaching us in this, in this very short but very thick, very useful verse is this. Not all teaching is talking. 
Not all teaching is talking. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Sometimes this, this verse, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, is used to describe the way we should interact in our interpersonal relationships. You shouldn't talk so much, you should listen, you should be attentive, and this way you'll hear what that person is saying, and you won't get angry when there's confusion. That is probably useful relationship advice, but as we are about to see, that is not what hear means. As a matter of fact, it's not what any of us mean when we tell someone, I need you to hear me. And I, I had this illustrated to me this week. When I'm instructing my daughter, Zoe, she's nearly four, she'll be four in February, and I want her to obey me in a few minutes, I say, are you listening? You need to listen to what I'm about to tell you. What I don't mean is this, open your ears and allow the sound to enter and have an effect on your brain. I mean, when I am done talking, I want you to obey. Are you listening, Zoe? And she usually does. She's a really good girl. <laughs> That's what James is saying. Be quick to hear God's words. Be quick to listen to what Jesus says. Be quick to do. Be quick to obey. Be quick to go. And slow to speak. Because not all teaching is talking. Jesus told us to teach these disciples that we're making from all nations, all ethnicities, all peoples. To teach them to observe what he's commanded. And there is occasion to tell them what Jesus told them. And that's important. There is absolutely occasion to say, hey, Jesus wants you to do this. Come join me and we're going to do it together. Jesus wants you to stop doing this because that's bad for you and it's bad for the people around you. There is occasion to tell them what it is Jesus has taught them. But there is always occasion to show them what Jesus has taught you. If the people around you know that you're a follower of Christ, that you're a believer, that you're a disciple, and I hope they do, I really hope they do, I want you to know something. This is a sobering thought. You are always teaching. At all times, if people know that you're a follower of Jesus, you might as well, before you do anything, stand up on a chair and say, hey, this is what Jesus would do if he was here, and then go ahead and do it. And James, being aware of that, after Jesus said the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he rose into heaven. And we're waiting for his return, which is extremely exciting. Very shortly after that, his half-brother James became the first pastor of the first and only, at that time, megachurch Jerusalem. And he knew what he wanted to tell those people. Be quick to hear. Do the things that Jesus instructed us. It's good for us. I'm going to unpack it for you. I'll help explain why. But please, be quick to hear. Obey his commands. Slow to speak and slow to anger. Because I probably don't have to tell you how damaging it is to the message, to the gospel, to our going, when we talk a whole lot and walk very little. It's extremely difficult for us to share. For us to make disciples is almost impossible if we're just blah, 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 blah. But we're not hearing, we're not listening, we're not obeying. Let's go a little bit further. James helps to explain. This is verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I really want to focus in on that word meekness because what James reveals is this. It takes a teachable spirit to learn to obey Jesus' commands. It takes a teachable spirit to learn to obey Jesus' commands. When I was young, and I was being corrected by something, it didn't even have to be behavioral. It could be, I don't know, playing basketball. I was not a very good basketball player. When I got to high school, I started wrestling. I was, I was better at that, just sort of understood it more. But my dad is a pretty good basketball player. You may not know it, but he's got, Pastor Mike has a, has a fade hook shot that, I mean, it is, it is something for a guy of his age and size. He can, he can put it down, all right? But I would not be a very good basketball player. I could cover, I could sort of dribble and pass. I could not shoot at all, basically at all. I, I used to console myself. Every shot I make in wrestling is a shot I have to miss in basketball. <laughs> but earlier, before I started wrestling, he would try to explain it to me. He says, Nathan, you got to have your arms up. you got to be looking through. And I would say this. This is the phrase of someone who is not meek, does not have a teachable spirit. I would say, I know. Man, it embarrasses me even to think that. That's a phrase when I hear it from, from, from someone I'm trying to help. It really, it really bums me out. 
Because it takes a teachable spirit to learn, especially to learn to obey Jesus' commands. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Jesus' commands in the New Testament are very useful. Some of them are challenging because it's different from what we used to do. Some of it is challenging because it goes against our nature for those of us who haven't accepted him yet. But if we, if we come to Jesus with meekness, if we come to God's word with meekness, with humility, with this understanding, you know what? I need some help. I need some instruction. I need to be taught to observe all that he has commanded me. If we come with that meekness, we can learn. I really want to come to the phrase that it says in verse 21, and I really want to unpack this, which is able to save your soul. For those of us who, are, who, are, who come up in the church, that might be like, whoa, that seems a little bit unusual. We've got to receive the word in order for our soul to be saved. That sounds like go to heaven. I want you to know that's not what James is saying. The reason I know that is because up in verse 19, we don't have to go back to it, but you can see it in your worship folders. James already addressed his audience as brothers, believers, people who are already saved. What James means is this, and it is so practical. James was an interesting guy. He wasn't interested in just theory and concepts, which are useful. He wanted to put the rubber on the road. And he said this, you receive with meekness the implanted word. You listen to Jesus' instructions, you obey, you, you go, it'll save your skin, buddy. Literally what he was saying is you could be headed down a path contrary to God's plan, and it is leading to death and destruction. That is a massive theme of Scripture that sometimes we, we seem to miss out, that going against God's commands isn't just sinful, which is just sinful. I feel funny even saying that. It is. <laughs> that is sinful. It is also bad for you. It is going to hurt you. It is going to lead to an outcome that is harmful for you. But if we have a teachable spirit, if we have a meek spirit, if we listen to what Jesus commands and we receive it with that meekness, it can literally save us in tight situations. It can save us from situations that would hurt us. It can save us from situations that would kill us. That is what James is explaining. That's what Jesus wants us to do. We could just believe in Jesus, which is terrific, and I want everyone to believe in Jesus because that's what saves you unto heaven, to live with God forever. In the meantime, what do we do? We go and we make disciples, and we observe what he's commanded because it is good for us. We teach them to observe what he's commanded us and commanded them because it's good for them, and it can save you. Your life. James makes it even a little bit more clear in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James uses an awesome analogy to explain this difference between a hearer and a doer. When Jesus says, observe the things I command, I want you to do them, they're good for you. I want you to teach other people after they've believed in me, after they've been baptized, showing the whole world that they're going to follow me, teach them to obey me because it's good. For those people who just hear, but don't do, don't follow, don't obey, don't go, it's like this. I get up in the morning, I got up this morning, brush my teeth, I don't want to offend if someone wants to come pray with me after the service put on clothes that I think are presentable but still, you know, can interact with people, aren't going to push anybody away, this very neutral blue sort of color. And then I go to the mirror and I take a look at this. <laughs> I have recently done something different with my hair. When I moved here, for years and years and years I was a wrestler. I had to keep my hair a certain way. I wasn't allowed to have a beard. And then for several years after that, I was security supervisor while we were living in North Carolina, no beard. And now I have this freedom, but I want to I pay attention to it. So I bought this product called Grooming Clean. 
and that's, and that's how I do this. <laughs> and I'm pretty happy with it. Now you might say, did you look in the mirror and forget what you look like? Because what's going on here, Pastor Nathan? <laughs> Well, I'm committed to letting this grow. We'll see what happens. I may wind up giving up on this. But if I got up and I looked in the mirror and my hair was like this and I had drool on my face and boogers coming out of my nose and I see it, I look in the mirror and I see it and I say, oh, man, I need to make some improvements. And I walk away and just, ah, whatever. And I just came to church looking like that. You'd be like, that dude is nuts. What is wrong with him? Didn't he look in the mirror? That is what James is saying. For those of us who have God's word and we look into it, he calls it the law of liberty. Those are the commands of the New Testament, not to be mistaken with the law of Moses. The law of Moses was good and useful and righteous, and it came from God, but it revealed basically one thing. You cannot get to God by yourself. Jesus comes along, fulfills all of the Mosaic law, doesn't sin against it once, dies to forgive our sins, raises again so that he defeats sin, death, and evil, so that for those of us who believe in him, we can take hold of that salvation. But he also gave us new instructions, and he repeated some old ones. And that is the law of liberty. Elsewhere in the New Testament, they call it the law of grace. It is these instructions that for those of us who believe, if we follow them, it can save our life, save our skin. It's good for us. It's good for the people around us. We should follow it. But when we look into it, we say, okay, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. I'm supposed to obey Jesus' commands. I'm, supposed to, um, I'm still not supposed to steal or kill or, um, or lie. And all of, all of the Ten Commandments, except one, are repeated in Scripture. Isn't that interesting? Does anybody know which one? Don't guess, because I'll feel embarrassed if I have to tell you, no, you're also not allowed to commit adultery. <laughs> anybody know? To honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Everything else is repeated in the New Testament. Pretty interesting, huh? I'm not saying don't observe the Sabbath. I just think that's interesting. But Jesus repeats all these laws, the law of liberty. And if we look at it and say, okay, this is the playbook. This is what we're supposed to do. I'm just going to go do my own thing. It's like this weirdo coming to church with his hair like this. It's bizarre. It's strange. It isn't characteristic of a doer. That's the kind of thing that just the hearer does. I heard a pastor tell an illustration in North Carolina. He said, it's like this. Imagine I tell my daughter, sweetie, go clean your room. I'm heading out. When I get back, I would like for your room to be clean. And she says, okay. He gets home, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, and he says, sweetie, did you clean your room? She says, no, Father, but I memorized your command. I know that my father told me to clean my room. I memorized it. I wrote it on note cards all around the house, so I know. My dad says to clean my room. Did you clean your room? Nope. That is just being a hearer. That's not being a doer. It's not being a disciple. It's not going. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, he says it in verse 15. He also repeats it in verse 23. If you love me, keep my commands. I cannot emphasize enough that the commands of Jesus, what James calls the law of liberty, what Jesus said when he says, teach them to observe all that I've commanded, they are not arbitrary. They're because he loves us. He knows what's good for us. He knows what's going to help us share his gospel with other people. And for us to obey them, for us to follow them, for us to do them, is to love him. I do love Jesus. I'm thankful for what he's done for me. I want to show that love by being a doer. And then James brings it home. Verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I'm sorry, I think I missed a fill in the blank. Back when we were talking about doers and hearers, simply hearing is not the same as doing. Disciples go. That was that, that was that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> and I have some more right here. This is my big idea for this message. Disciples don't just hear Jesus' commands. Disciples obey them. Disciples go. Discipleship isn't just talking the talk. As a matter of fact, you should bridle your tongue. 
You should be careful about what you say. Like I said, this does not mean don't tell the people around you what Jesus has commanded. That's an important step, by the way, in teaching them to obey. But if your talk doesn't match your walk, that hypocrisy is going to make it hard to make disciples. They will not be interested in believing him, let alone being baptized to show that they're a part of his message. There are people, I've been one of them from time to time. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a constant thing that we resist, who do these good things, and they think, man, this is terrific. People see these good things I'm doing, not because I want to inspire them to follow Jesus. I want to inspire them to follow me and think I'm awesome. That religion is worthless. Most of the time, I find the word religion a dirty word. I think that it pretty much means this. Of all the world religions, they all say this. This is what you do so that God will accept you. Christianity is all about what God has done so that you are acceptable. But James makes it real clear what pure, he even uses that, that word, pure religion is this. Now that you believe, follow not follow so that he'll love you. I already love you infinitely. Now that you believe, now that you know me, now that you've been baptized to show the whole world that you know and follow me, follow. Love the people around you, especially those in need. And resist getting drawn in to these things in the world that are going to draw you away from me. Disciples don't just hear. They don't just listen. They don't just memorize. They do do those things. But disciples obey. Disciples do. Disciples follow. Disciples go. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This year, we are going to be exploring what go means, what Jesus meant when he said to go. This entire year, we're going to be covering lots of subjects. We're going to be covering friendships and what it is we're supposed to do, what it is we're supposed to follow, the commands we should observe to have healthy friendships. We're going to be observing um, uh, how, we, how we manage our resources that God has provided us. There's going to be a portion coming up this year where we're going to discuss things you want to hear about, all in the name of becoming better doers, not just better knowers, not just better listeners, good things, those are good things, goers. So today I want to leave you with this. We need to stop simply thinking that listening or just, just hearing, even memorizing Jesus' word is, is the thing that we're called to do. Because what I would much rather is to know one or two things Jesus told me to do and work them real good. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If that was the only thing I knew and I was working to do it, that would be spectacular. I want us to stop, for those of us who have been in church a long time, just being listeners. That's true for me as well. For those of us who don't know him yet, not even sure we want to follow him, what I would like for you to do is this. Stop assuming that this whole Jesus thing is just a way to police what it is I do, to take away my fun, and to honestly give, give this message a chance. Please continue to come to Sunrise Church, hear what it is we're discussing, and assess it deeply. Discuss it with the pastors. Discuss it with, uh, with folks who are here because it is able to save us. I want us to use caution, because during this entire year, we're going to be exploring what it means to go. We're going to be exploring Jesus' commands, and they are true. Here's the thing. Not everybody in the world agrees about what's true. I want us to use caution as to where we seek truth. I want us to assess it. I want us to test it. I want us to go deeper. I want us to go further. And what I think you'll discover, if you stick with us this year, is that truth is found in God's word. Use caution about where it is we seek truth. And I want us to go. Once we've learned that truth, once we've been taught ourselves and we teach the people around us to observe all that he's commanded, I want us to do it. 
I know that's very broad, but it will get more specific as the year goes on. This is going to be an exciting year. And I want us to go make disciples of all nations. Encourage them to get baptized into his name. And then to observe, to follow, to listen, to go and do the things that Jesus has commanded. Some of you might be in here, um, maybe first time or first several time guests, and you've been interested in this Jesus guy. I like Jesus. I think what he was explaining to the world was terrific. I'm really interested. But you know what slows me down? You know what trips me up? All the talk, 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 talking that people do in his name. And when I look into their life, it is not the same. Number one, I want to apologize for that. It is an unfortunate reality that not everyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus follows him very well. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus and Sunrise Church is all about making disciples. For those of us who believe, Jesus did come to save us. That is spectacular, amen? But he didn't save us just to sit around and wait for the mothership to come vacuum us up out of here to be disciples, to be goers, to be doers, to bring other people onto this team. I have this image in my mind about how unique and strange and amazing and beautiful Jesus is. He comes into the world and wins the game, dies and raises again and wins. The game is over. And now we start recruiting teammates. <laughs> come be on the winning team. Come be part of this. It is so exciting. And the major, in my opinion, one of the highest indicators that we are following, going, obeying, doing disciples is to make more disciples. If you want to be a part of that, it can start today. It starts with believing. That's the first step. It starts with believing a few things. It starts with believing that all of humanity is disconnected from God when we come into the world. And it's because of sin. The Bible tell us that our tells us that our first parents sinned, and that messed everything up. But frankly, every single one of us sins in our life, proving that we're disconnected from him. We've got to believe that. We've got to understand that. We've got to accept that. The next thing we believe is that Jesus came to earth to become a man to save us. He was God, he is God, he always will be God, and he came to earth to save us. We also have to believe this. The way that he saved us was to take the punishment that we deserved. Death. He died on a cross, taking on all of the sins of the world, everything that separates us from God, he took credit for and took the punishment for and died. But it did not stop there. Three days later, he rose again to life, defeating sin, death, and evil, so that for those of us who believe in him, we don't need to fear those things anymore. If that is something you want to believe, pray this with me. Jesus, I have sinned. I do things that hurt me. I do things that hurt people around me, and I don't want to anymore. I believe you are God. I believe you came to earth as a man, and I believe you died to save me. More than that, I believe you rose again to new life, to give me life for believing in you. I believe in you now, and I want you to help me to follow you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that for the first time, I very much would like to hear about it. Please pluck up the courage to come tell one of the pastors. We want to celebrate that with you and maybe give you some resources to help show you what the next couple steps are of following. If you want to pray or talk to any of the pastors on any subject, um, your health, we'd love to pray with you. Something that's happening in your life that's challenging, we'd love to pray with you. Something that's happening in your life that's Terrific. We'd love to celebrate that with you. We're available to you. Let's rise and praise God.